edge selection mode has a lot of its own sort of unique tools. So uh, we can try to take a look at a few of those. Um, so one that I'm going to want to look at right here is create shape from selection. This can be very useful if you want to create a spline based on a selection of edges and then you want to use that spline to perform a different operation. Say you wanted to have something animating around the outside of the cylinder or you wanted to use some sort of a procedural animation extrude to extrude a vine that wrapped around it or something like that. Then you could easily just take a loop and hit this create shape from selection button and it will automatically create a spline out of that edge selection that you had. And you'll see now I selected that edge and if I move it up there you can see it's got a, a spline right there or a shape that was made from my selected edge. So there are quite a few applications or uses for that button and uh, it's very easily accessible under the edge drop down menu. Now this panel here under loops this is a very useful panel. Um, there are some awesome tools here that I think definitely require some attention. So first of all, we have our standard good old connect tool. We're all used to this tool. It's the same as connect over here. Basically you so make a selection of edges, hit connect, and it will draw edges uh, perpendicular to your selection, connecting them together. And again, you can choose how many segments you want. You can also choose to pinch and slab your segments, and so on and so forth. It's the exact same connect tool that we're all used to. But a new tool that we have here is Distance Connect. Now Distance Connect makes your life a little bit easier because previously you would have had to select each one of the edges that you wanted to connect together one by one and then hit connect. With Distance Connect, it gets rid of that necessity. You just select the two outermost edges of the selection and then hit Distance Connect and it will connect in between those edges. So that's a very, very useful tool. And after that, another one that we have, actually I'm going to skip Flow Connect for a second here and I'm going to jump down to these loop tools. The reason I want to do this is because I I have my two parallel edges here. So I just want to show you something. Under these loop tools, there are two very useful tools that I want to talk about. One's called Build End and one is called Build Corner. Now the Build End tool will allow you to create an end to some loops if they end in an N-gon or a multi-sided polygon and you want to quad that off for uh, subdivision purposes and trying to keep your model, or your model clean. So what you would normally want to do is you might want to take your, your standard cut tool or something like that and you might want to actually go through and try to create quads out of this existing endon just so that everything stays nice and neat and it has four quads inside this ending quad here. But that's a little bit slow and it's not the cleanest procedure. So under loops here, this build end tool is a one-click way of doing that and it creates it much more even and much more cleanly. So all you have to do is select the edge that's in between your two parallel edge loops. You just select that edge and then you hit build end and it automatically builds an end for you and makes nice clean quads for you at the end of those two parallel loops. Another extremely, extremely useful tool is the Build Corner tool. And I'm going to show you how to use that one right now. So basically, I'm going to use my old-fashioned connection tool to go through here and make a connection between these rings, but that turns a corner. 
So in the past, we could always do this. We could select edges running in one direction, or a ring running in one direction, and a ring running in the opposite direction, and then hit connect, and it would connect around a corner. But then what you would end up with is you would end up with a five-sided face here, which is sloppy and not very clean for the purposes of creating a subdivision model or just clean geometry in general. So the build corner tool, what that does is that automatically builds a corner for you. And it will clean up that area where your connect went around the corner and created the triangle and the five-sided polygon. So to do that, all you have to do is select the edge of the triangle or the edge that goes around the corner and then hit the build corner button. And it will automatically create three quads within that corner polygon. Two very, very useful tools. Now, moving on to Flow Connect. I find Flow Connect to also be extremely, extremely, extremely useful in an everyday sort of situation. What Flow Connect does is it will connect edges together, but normally using a regular connect, what uh, the function would do is it would simply just connect those edges. But that edge that runs through is just cutting the polygon in half. It's not changing the flow of the topology or the flow of the model in any way. It's just simply dissecting that ring in two. And if you wanted to subdivide your model or turbo smooth it, what that would do is it would run in, you would run into problems where you would start to lose the shape of your model, especially if you want to have a smoothly flowing piece of geometry like a cylinder. And uh, just so we can see what I'm doing, I'm going to create a new cylinder here, as I think that would be the best to illustrate this point. So once again, I'm going to convert my cylinder to a polygon, or an evidable poly. Um, actually, that one has too many sides for me. So I'm going to lower this down to, say, about eight sides, so we can really see what I'm talking about. So, we are going to go and convert this to a poly. Now, in the past, if I wanted to add geometry to the outside of the cylinder, then what I would, would have had to do is I would have had to connect it, like so. But then I would have ended up with these lines that intersect it, but they don't add to the flow of the cylinder. And if I were to try and smooth that mesh, you would run into some really interesting sort of problems. Um, but what Flow Connect will do, which I, again, find amazingly, amazingly useful, Just one second here. I need to add a little bit more geometry here to sort of illustrate my point. All right, this should work out better now. So now I'll add that smooth modifier on again. So now, as you can see, when I smooth my cylinder, I get a nice sort of round shape. But then if I were to go through and try to loop these and then connect them using the old fashioned method, then that would create some problems when I went up to smooth it. There we go. That's what I was looking for. As you can see, I no longer have a smooth cylinder. Now what I have is more of a polygonal object. So I have my subdivision on, but you still end up with this sort of low poly looking result where the sides of the cylinder are not very smooth. So now we're going to get to the final uh, point, which is the purpose of Flow Connect. What Flow Connect does 
and it will be better illustrated from the top view, is it will connect the rings that we have selected, but it will continue the flow, the convex flow of the geometry or the topology of the model. It will interpolate the information between the different edges and it will try to continue that flow. So when you subdivide your model, you end up with a much, much smoother looking result. This, again, has numerous, numerous different applications. Um, possibilities are almost endless with that. So moving on from the flow connect, there aren't too many other ones uh, that we really need to discuss. Um, we have the insert and remove ones. Insert will just insert an edge loop. Very simple. Select an edge, hit insert, and it inserts an edge loop. I prefer the swift loop method myself, so uh, I rarely use the insert one. Remove is the same thing. Remove, you select an edge loop and hit remove, and it will remove the edge loop. So, uh, again, I, I don't really use those very much. I would probably use the paint, connect, or the swift loop buttons for those. Lastly, we have set flow button. Now, the set flow button is, is kind of nifty too, because what it will do is it will try to average the flow of the selected geometry between the surrounding existing, existing geometry. So basically, if you have some geometry that you've moved around and adjusted, and you're not very happy with what you've done or the results, you can hit the set flow button of your loops, and it will just try to average it out and match it up to the existing geometry that's around it. You can do that on loops, or you can do it by selecting a single edge, and it will set the flow of the entire loop. So again, it's, a, it's kind of a useful tool, especially when you're trying to deal with more complex sort of objects, like uh, characters especially, where they have a lot of flowing, curving edge loops that go all over the entire model. You can take a selection and hit set flow, and if things are starting to look a little wonky, it will just sort of even it out a little bit for you. That's about all I have to talk about with the edge selection mode. So the last thing that I want to talk about is I want to talk about the polygon tools, polygon selection mode. So again, you can see most of these tools are almost the exact same, so I won't try to talk about them too much. Um, the first thing I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at this Quadrify tool. This one's kind of cool if you have accidentally somehow um, turned your mesh into triangles. Sometimes in production, what we'll do is we'll export our mesh to the editor, and uh, somehow, you know, people may have lost their working file or their original file. So when uh, meshes get exported to game engines, especially, they get triangulated because the game engines don't really understand the quads. So every quad face gets uh, turned into a triangle or two triangles. So if you were to take uh, an exported mesh, like an OBJ or an FBX, from a uh, game engine directory and try to bring it back into the editor to edit it, or sorry, back into your native application, Max, to edit it, you would end up with a mesh that has a lot of triangles running through it. Something like this, where the mesh has been all triangulated. And that becomes very difficult for editing topology. Um, when, you know, when you're trying to move things around or if you're trying to add things to a model or clean it up or fix it up. It's a lot harder to deal with a ton of triangles than it is to deal with quads. So what I like to do is use this Quadrify All button. It's like magic. Basically, it just looks at your model, looks at all the triangles, and deletes the edges, turning all the quads into triangles, and turns them back into quads. So that's a very useful button if you ever run into that problem. Under geometry, quantify all. Next up, under these polygon tools, um, we have our extrude. Extrude is just your 
standard extrude button. So once again, you have your extrude by group, extrude by normal, and extrude by polygon. I will explain those because they've been around for a long time and uh, we should all know what those are. Um, we also have our standard bevel option. Once again, same functions as extrude, except that you can scale your extruded portion in or out depending on what you would like to do to create a nice beveled sort of pyramid object. Again, that's a very standard function. It's under your edit polygons uh, tools on your right hand bar. And then uh, after that, we have our inset tool. Once again, standard inset found under the edit polygons of your right hand bar. So I won't talk about that too much. Bridge tool. Bridge tool is fun. Um, we did have that tool in the existing right hand bar as well. But in this one, there's a little bit of a different functionality to it. You can select the edges you want to bridge and then hit bridge or hold shift and hit bridge, which opens up your bridge options, which are very similar to the bridge options that we had in previous versions of Max. You can change the number of segments that you want to bridge with and so on and so forth. But a nice new little function that it has is if you go to your polygon mode and then you simply select the bridge tool, you can just click on polygons one by one, click on one polygon and then click on the opposing polygon and it will try to bridge in between those polygons. Um, it appears that this function is a little bit confused for me at the moment. Uh, that probably has something to do with the fact that I converted my model to an editable patch and triangulated it and then quadrified it and did all this stuff. So the bridge tool in that capacity is a little confused at the moment. Um, perhaps if I try to just create a polygon here by itself and then a, an opposite polygon maybe we can use the bridge tool to bridge those polygons a little more effectively. Nope. Doesn't seem to know what's going on. The triangulation must have confused it. But anyways, you get the idea. It works usually. So uh, again, just click bridge and then you can click on one edge, click on the opposing edge. And it should bridge in between those edges without being all crazy like it's doing right now. Geopoly, this is a kind of weird tool. I don't use it, or I haven't found a reason for it. But basically, you click it, and it tries to make any of the geometry that you've selected turn into uniform sort of shaped polygons. So if you have any really kind of strange, wonky looking polygons that are all stretched out and distorted, if you select that and then hit Geopoly, it will try its best to make it a little bit more uniform in nature and uh, even it out somewhat. I don't really use it that much, but I guess it could be useful in some capacity. Uh, this flip one is just a quick way of flipping the normals of your polygons. They have a button like that in Maya. Previously, you had to use a normals modifier to change the normals of selected polygons, but now you can do it just by clicking a button, which is kind of neat. So uh, yeah, I like that tool. Flips the face normals around nice and quick. Um, I believe that's it for the polygon tools that I wanted to show you. So the last thing that I'm going to go and show you now is I'm going to show you the freeform tools on the next panel. I'm not going to show you all of the freeform tools. I'm just going to show you some of them because there are a lot of freeform tools and uh, it could take a whole other tutorial to properly display those tools. But there are a couple that I really want to show you. Oh, and that actually reminds me. There was two more amazing tools over in the polygon sub-object mode which I have yet to show you. So uh, anyways, 
I'll go back to those because I need to use one of these freeform tools to show you that one anyways. So um, the first one I'm going to show you, and uh, the ones that I'm mostly going to be looking at are the splines tool here, branches, shift, and push and pull. These are the only tools I'm going to show you today. Uh, I won't go over the rest of them as we just don't have time. So the first one is splines. This one is really cool because it's sort of a freehand way to draw splines and edges. It's a very kind of neat and uh, free-flowing, hence the word free-form. Uh, so I definitely, definitely like that tool because it allows you to get much more sort of uh, pretty and flowing splines than you were previously able to use um, using the old spline tools. And the old spline tools, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, can be found under the creation tab and then uh, just the next tab over from standard primitives or the object creation tab, you have your spline creation tab. And the old method was much uh, slower, more like vector drawing in Photoshop or something like that. It gives you a little bit more fine-tuned, precise control of drawing your spline, but it's not as free-flowing or kind of elegant as the spline tool under the freeform tools. Oh, there we go. You have to be in sub-object mode, by the way, to be able to use these tools. So, it's giving me some problems. There we go. So, I've drawn a nice sort of organic, uh, free-flowing looking spline. And I like how it looks. It's nice and swirly. So I'm just going to take that down and insert it into the top of my cylinder. And now I'm going to go back and show you a couple of the tools that I missed under the Polygon Tools and the Graphite Modeling Tools tab. One of the tools that I missed is Extrude on Spline. Extrude on Spline is awesome. It was something that was available in Maya, and we now have it in Max, and I'm very happy for that. So basically, oh, excuse me, I need to select in Polygons before I do that. So I'll just grow my selection here until I get a nice shape that I like. That should look for me. Now I'm going to go back here to Extrude on Spline. And all you need to do is just pick your spline, hit the button, pick spline, choose your spline, and it will extrude on the spline. It looks kind of crazy right now, um, but with a little tweaking, we should get it to look really cool. So basically, the first thing that you're going to want to do is probably up the number of segments to get a little bit more of a flowing extrusion. So I'm going to give it like 24 segments. The next thing you can do is you can adjust the taper amount. That's very useful for something like this, where you can taper off the extrusion to a very fine point at one end and very wide at the other end. The next option is taper curve. And that's similar to taper amount, except that it will adjust the taper in a side view. It's sort of the, the curvature of the taper. So taper amount is just the overall value of the taper. Taper curve is the degree to which it tapers along that value. So as you can see, when I adjust the taper curve and I give it a negative value, it will taper it more severely or more extremely towards the end. Um, whereas if I left the taper curve off, then it would stay roughly thick and chunky all the way to the end even though I've increased the taper amount to be relatively high. But once I throw the taper curve on, it's kind of nice because it'll only stay thick near the very bottom 
and then it will start to uh, taper more and more extremely towards the end of the swirl. And the last thing is you can even add a little bit of a twist in there, um, which is kind of nice if you're trying to do things like like tree trunks or something like that. Uh, most trees sort of twist as they grow out of the ground. So if you throw a little bit of a twist in there, it can be very useful to create a little bit more of a realistic or organic effect. So that's extrude on spline. The next thing that I want to show you is a little thing called hinge. I believe it's called hinge. So we go back to polygons and select hinge. Now this one is very cool because what it will do is it will extrude the polygons on an angle. It won't extrude them straight up. It will extrude them sequentially along an angle. Um, but it will hinge on a specific polygon. So you have to choose which polygon you want to be the hinge. Now you have to think of it as if it were a door and there was a hinge attached to the door jaw. Where would you want the door to swing from? So I'm going to choose this edge right here to be my hinge. And now as you can see, the polygons are extruding on an angle, one after the other, and they're getting smaller and smaller towards the area where it hinges, and the hinge polygon remains attached to the other hinge polygon. And you can choose your angle, and you can choose your number of segments as you extrude it. And as you can see, this could become very useful, uh, especially for making things like pipes or other structures like that, air ducts maybe, vents, things like this that, that do hinge out from their surface. Um, previously, you probably had to jump through a few hoops to get a nice curved pipe like that. But in this case, you can just make a straight pipe, you can hinge it, and then you can extrude it again, and then you can have a pipe with a nice 90 degree bend in it, or something similar. Another option uh, or function for the hinge tool could be a structure similar to this, like I'm creating right here. If you had a rooftop and you wanted to have an air duct or some kind of a, a vent, or even the scope portion of a, a tank, then once again this hinge function could be very useful in creating that sort of a structure. So these are two very useful sort of extrude options that were not previously available. Lastly, there are a few freeform tools which I would like to demo here. Um, shift, branches, and push and pull. So we'll start with branches. Branches, to me, can be a little bit gimmicky. Uh, I can't see a ton of uses, except for maybe making some branches. But I can see how it could be neat. Sort of reminds me of the hook brush in, in ZBrush, or the snake hook, where you just grab a portion of the geometry and you start dragging out. And uh, it will just drag some gradually tapering sort of branches or swirls based on the polygon that you selected and in your viewport. It doesn't work perfectly the way you want all the time. It's kind of weird and doesn't create the most beautiful results. But you can do some sort of neat little stuff with it. So that's branches. Shift I find to be much more useful. Shift is sort of like the tweak brush in ZBrush, if you're familiar with, with ZBrush. Um, basically, you have your focal uh, shift, your fall off, where you have your hot spot in the center, which is shown by the white circle, and your outer fall off area, which is shown by the black circle. And you can adjust those by holding control to adjust the outer circle and shift to adjust the inner circle. And then all you need to do is left mouse 
in your viewport, and you can sort of nudge your geometry around in screen space and just grab things and tweak them to make them, you know, a little bit more aesthetically appealing in the way that you like. So this could be, a, as you can see, a very useful tool in quickly doing some soft selection and shaping out some of your geometry in the screen space. So that's shift. Push and pull is somewhat similar to shift. I'm just going to um, basically apply another turbo smooth modifier to this as push and pull tends to work a little bit better with some more geometry. So the push and pull brush is almost like your standard brush in ZBrush. You can uh, use it to draw geometry to the positive or to the negative on your model. And uh, there are a few quick hotkeys. So holding shift will relax the mesh, relax it down. And then the other quick ones are control to revert, control shift to grow your brush, and control alt to control the fall off. So again, control shift to grow the brush, control alt to control the amount of uh, intensity or fall off, and shift to relax left click to add, control to revert, and lastly you can use alt to subtract. Left click add, alt subtract, shift control resize, shift alt strength, and control to revert your mesh back to normal very, very useful tool. So uh, I believe that's all the time I have for now. That has been my demo of 3D Studio Max 2010's graphite modeling tools and a couple of the most useful freeform uh, poly adjusting and sculpting tools. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and thank you for watching.